Um, I would like to introduce you to our next speaker in the data management and preservation stream, uh, David Connell. David is the AADC metadata officer and a focal point for liaison on data submission, uh, metadata creation and management. Please welcome Dave. Hello, good morning. All right, one thing I should point out is that um, often people come to Antarctic talks expecting big, pretty Antarctic pictures, and that's the only one. So, so get your fill. <laughs> there are other pictures, just not Antarctic pretty ones. Okay, so first of all, I thought I should begin by just pointing out some key things you should know about Antarctica. So basically, science in Antarctica has been around for a very long time. Most people are, are really familiar with all the, uh, the heroic sort of area of people trying to make it to the South Pole and the like. But um, one thing you may not know is that Douglas Mawson was actually offered a spot on Robert Falcon Scott's um, expedition to make an attempt on the South Pole. But he turned it down in order to lead his own scientific expedition, which was good for science and also for his life expectancy. And um, all that sort of here kept, he kept the science sort of going. Hang on, I'm going to take the jingly thing off. He kept the, um, kept the science going, but also then in 1957 we, sort of, we had the International Geophysical Year, which was like a major year for science around the world. It had a huge Antarctic focus and sort of really kicked off um, sort of the modern era of, of science in the Antarctic. That led to the formation of the Antarctic Treaty, which was signed in 1961 by about 50 countries, and it's, pr it's probably one of the, uh, probably one of, or is the longest running international treaty which is still in effect today. And one of the um, key things about the Antarctic Treaty is that it says that all scientific data should be made freely available and um, be open to anybody who wants it. So that's sort of our charter, I guess. The other thing you should know about Antarctica, it's a very long, long way away. Um, even from Australia, it takes a week to get there by ship or about six hours in a commercial jet. Um, and it's very, very expensive to work there. It can cost anywhere between sort of many thousands of dollars to hundreds of thousands of dollars just to maintain a single person in the Antarctic for, for a, few, a few weeks to a year. Okay, so this is a little map just sort of shows you how many Antarctic stations there are. So you get the idea that there are quite a few of them. So there are a lot of people down there doing work. And these are the main organisations involved in scientific research. There's SCAR, which is the Scientific Committee of Antarctic Research, which is a part of the International Council for Science. Now, SCADM is the, is the data management sort of arm of SCAR, and they work with a group called the Global Change Master Director who provide all the metadata services for us. Okay. Um, Basically, at the Antarctic Division, we have a lot of, a lot of very varied and, and multi-themed science. So we do, we do science right across the spectrum, from physics to biology to glaciology, geology, you name it. Uh, we have uh, several hundred scientists um, based not only at the division, but also across many universities, um, a lot of international collaborators, and also we work with other state and, and federal um, agencies as well. This coming Antarctic season, we have 60 projects um, running, which is a little bit smaller than previous years, but that's sort of due to um, budget constraints. And our Antarctic program is overseen um, by the minister uh, who signs off on the whole thing and there's a committee that sort of that guides that along and we have a, obviously a strategic plan like most people do. And that all of that data is then tracked and managed and published by the Australian Antarctic Data Centre. And we've been doing that for about the last 16 years. And our manager then reports to the, um, to the chief scientist who's responsible for um, our data policy. Okay, so what that basically means is that we do a lot of different science. It's an awful lot to keep track of. We've got to make it available to everybody in the world, and it costs a lot of money, so we don't really want to waste it. So lost data is not really sort of what we're about. Okay, so this is a very complicated diagram that my boss um, drew, because she loves these. And um, it's got lots of lines and arrows and boxes and stuff. So, But what it basically says, I'll just run you through the simple version, is that we have a data policy, which underpins the entire, um, the entire program. That's been signed off by, um, by the Minister, which is currently Tony Burke, and that basically outlines all the obligations um, that our scientists have. So we have a large number of fine and upstanding scientists in the Antarctic Division. So what they do is well, they create an application and then they'll submit that in for approval. So that first of that application is first of all it's peer reviewed and then it goes off to a, goes off to a committee who then review it and they'll assess it and give it a um, give it an historical uh, give it a give it a score as to how likely that project is going to succeed. And they'll take into account previous submission history as well. If the project gets approved, we hand out a lot of money and support back to, back to the scientist. And the scientist then creates a data management plan. And so this is something that's new for this year. So this sort of outlines sort of what they expect to be able to do. 
scientist then goes off and does all the work, keeps them very, themselves very busy, and then it's during the, this whole process we keep an eye on them at the same time. Now, it's not only sort of just a one-way sort of big brother sort of type approach, but we are, we are actually sort of working with them to sort of you know, try and help them and provide them with support at the same time. So it's very much a two-way street. Uh, once the whole thing is finished, basically they then hand over the data and we are expecting basically all data and metadata from, from the project and, but we don't, and we, don't, we also allow them to actually archive their data with other repositories as well, as long as we've sort of checked it out first and we're happy with it. Sometimes if things don't go well um, and the data doesn't come in for any particular reason or we are unable to get hold of the scientist, then we'll sort of mark that project up as having sort of failed as far as we're concerned. Um, and what that means is that in the future, if that scientist then goes and applies for another project, that failure will be taken into account and they'll re receive a lower score when it comes to um, deciding whether or not they deserve more money. Okay, so what that all basically means is that we needed a tool to be able to effectively manage all of our data sets um, and our scientists and our, and our projects. Because basically what we're sort of gearing towards here is a big performance management system for our scientists from the data end just to make sure that everything's going okay. And that led to the creation of my science. And so here we have a few little screenshots. So this is basically what it looks like. Um, and my science is based around projects and it's based around the scientists and where they stand regarding their metadata and data. Um, it's a tool not only for the scientists, but it's a tool for the data center staff as well, so that we can all sort of you know, work together. And we can all approach it from either end. So this is just sort of a quick look at what it looks like. So you can see we have uh, information like sort of when the project is running. Um, you've got a project title, uh, whether the project's been finished or not, in this case this one has, uh, lists out um, people, people involved um, in the project. We have this summary and so on, and there's little to-do items and things which notes that the data centre staff can make so they, they can sort of make sure that they're okay. And spots here for creating an online data management plan. Also links up to shows of publications and also importantly links to any metadata records and any data sets that are associated with this particular project. Okay, sorry, just getting my notes. Okay, so the data management plans, this is the new part. So basically what we've been getting our scientists to do here is we're getting them to think about sort of what it is that they might need um, from the data centre but also what they will be providing to the data centre in regards to their project. So the, the idea is that sort of in the, in the past people, um, when they do their projects, the project finishes and they come to us and say, they say, here's the data. And sometimes, you know, you'll have a project that's been running for, you know, five years and they hand over a big single Excel spreadsheet. And you're sort of thinking, really? That's, you, you made, this is all you've got out of, you know, five years worth of work? Um, and you know, some of them will say, sure, yeah, that's it. And then, you know, all we can do is we, yeah, we have to trust them, we have to believe them. So what, so what we thought would be, um, would be better is if before they actually start, if they could sort of write down, this is what's going to happen and this is what you can expect, then there won't be any of that confusion sort of at the end and all the backwards and forwards. So what we have here, we're working on getting an online um, data form um, ready. And basically it just sort of gets them to sort of identify, okay, this is what we're going to do, this is much likely how much space it's going to take, um, this is what we'll have in regarding to physical samples, which we don't actually store the physical samples, but it'll, but we, we can then pass that information on to people who do have to store the physical samples. And it also allows them to, to nominate who's actually going to be responsible for collecting the data so that we can chase the right person. Because often these projects are run by, there's somebody at the top who's very important and they have a whole ream of PhD students who go out and do the actual work for them. So this way we can go and target the actual appropriate people rather than always chasing sort of through, you know, through the one person. Okay. So that brings us to the metadata and citation sort of section, which sort of gets to the sort of the carrot part rather than the stick part of this whole process. Because previously sort of the whole um, stuff that I have been showing you is to do, I guess, to do more with the stick. So if they don't do it, then we hit them with a the stick and deny them funding in the future. This is sort of more is to do as what, you know, the what's in it for me part. So I'm sure most of you are familiar with metadata. Um, if anybody's probably at any research conference has probably heard of metadata, so I don't really need to explain that. But basically this is the public side of what, of what they get at sort of the end. So once they've, they've finished their project, their data has been catalogued and it's been archived, these metadata records go out um, to the world 
so that anybody can sort of you know, see and find that data. Um, and just to which we probably should point out is our metadata system, as mentioned earlier, is, is supplied by, um, by NASA, and they run the, the metadata tools for the entire um, Antarctic community around the world. Within our metadata records, we label our, our data with these other little logos. Um, this one on the right is the CC BY license, which I'm sure many of you have probably heard of, the Creative Commons license. And the one on the left is the PIC uh, license, which is the Polar Information Commons license, which actually also just uses the Creative Commons license, it's the exact same thing. But all the PIC thing is, is just, it just signifies that it's polar data. And that, that's been, was developed by a consortium of, of about Arctic and Antarctic sort of research organisations who got together and decided they wanted their own little version of Creative Commons. Okay, as well as all those little licences which would basically say that the data is freely available, you can reuse it as you like as long as you provide credit. We actually help out in that area by putting a link in all of our metadata records which shows you, which shows the scientists themselves but also shows other scientists how they should be um, citing this data. So this is all automatically generated from, from the information within the metadata record. It just takes the people involved listed out, um, takes the title and the dates and, and so on and puts all that there. Uh, we'll be revamping this a little bit because in the moment, uh, well, in the near future, we're going to be adding um, DOIs to our data sets. Uh, we're working with, with ANS um, to help us do that because if you want DOIs, they're the people to go see. So they tell me. And um, we'll be adding all sort of that information sort of in there as well. Uh, we won't be adding DOIs to all our data sets, we'll only be adding it to a few of them. So the ones that are stable, that are not likely to change, and generally only if the scientists themselves request it. Okay, so quick summary of all of that. Basically, in the Australian Antarctic Division we have a very unique research environment. Um, because we have such a broad range of science that we have to, we have to deal with and we have a large number of scientists, um, it's very expensive. And we have a data policy which underpins the, the whole um, data management framework um, organisation. So basically that policy has been signed off by the Minister. It outlines everything that the scientists have to do. And the data centre, we provide a place for them to archive all their data. We manage it for them. We provide it as um, backup services. And we make sure it's catalogued and archived and so it's tucked away for posterity. Uh, we've been doing this, as I mentioned, for about 16 years. And at the moment we have around about 2,000 metadata records. 85% uh, of those all point to data of some kind. Um, I'm not sure exactly how, much, how many terabytes of data we have, but it's quite a few. So there's a lot of data there that we can get, we can get access to. Uh, and pretty soon we'll be adding DOIs to all those as well. And as I mentioned, we're, having, we're now sort of doing a governance thing of all our projects, project management in effect. Um, where we'll be generating scores. That, so when the chief scientist comes back to us and says, how's this scientist going? We can say, this scientist is great. You should give them more money. Or this scientist is not so good. You should maybe just give them a few jelly beans and see how they go with that. <laughs> and also the final part is we're going to be starting to get involved in data, um, data submission and citation metrics so we can start generating reports. And once we get DOIs added onto our data sets, we can then sort of start seeing how where those data sets are being tracked and um, sorry being cited across the world around the world and we can track where they're being used and, and we're involved with the Thomson Reuters um, group as part of their data citation project and they have a little stall somewhere from the exhibition area so you can have the little pamphlets I think everybody got one in their hand in their conference bags so you can certainly go check that out if you want to um, and as I mentioned we're going to be tracking data citation with all of our with our data sets from the future okay so that's basically where I'm at so if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer a couple. Otherwise we can all just have a rest for the next few minutes. <laughs> yeah, you have a long walk, Nathan. <laughs> How? Nathan Dindoff, um, University of Tasmania. Um, how hard is implementing DOIs across all of the data set? What's involved in that? Uh, very easy. Probably the end people could probably answer that better than, than I will. Maybe they'll correct me if I get it wrong. Um, but basically, we've applied to ANS to become a, an organisation that's able to create our own DOIs. So they provide us um, with, I think, a big list of them. 
And then, so when a scientist comes to us and says, we want a DOI for our data set, we say, All right, here's the next one, and we just stick it on. And there's a filter in our metadata system already of which for, for putting a data set DOI in, so we just add it, add it in there, and, and you're done. And that's basically what there is. Um, and that DOI will then go to a landing page, so when you click on it, it takes you to a specific page, which is always going to be there, and it says, here's the data set, and so on. So from the science end, scientist end, it's very simple. You just basically say, please give me one, and I think for us, it's not a lot of work, but we're still developing it, so I'm not 100% sure. But I get, the idea I get is very simple. Uh, Melanie, who's from Ants? <laughs> Hello, so I'm Melanie from ANS, and um, if you'd like to find out more about DOIs, then come and talk to me, or there's the ANS booth too, but whoever, yeah. Okay, and I can tell you more about the minting and the data site cons consortium, etc. So, yeah. I've been working with Dave on getting his metadata records into ANS, so, yeah. yeah. That's right, and now we know what each other look like. Yeah. <laughs> This is not a, a, a stupid question, but how do you monitor compliance? Uh, so basically, what we have, if I back a few slides, okay. So this is our the screenshots of the MyScience system. So basically, sort of the way we do it, we have everything sort of is vetted by um, by particular people. We have. Uh, let's let's say a scientist A has a project in the data centre. A particular staff member will be assigned to be their liaison and make sure that they're okay and make sure that their data and stuff have come in. Um, so we can see whether they've got data. Oops. We can see whether their metadata records are here. So th these are the metadata records from this project. So if they hadn't ha didn't have a metadata record, there wouldn't be one there. Um, and we also assign each of these metadata records a status as to whether it's just a preliminary record or if it's actually been finished. So I, we can go and check sort of that. And that's all that's all checked by me as the metadata, metadata officer. So I say that metadata record is okay, big tick. Um, and then we can also see that we've got the data sets sort of listed here. Um, at the moment, what happens is the scientists will give us all the data. Um, we will look at that along with any other information we have about the project to decide, okay, that looks like they've done everything they've said they would, and then we'll just check, is that everything we should get? And they'll say yes or no, and if it is. But in the future, we'll use the data management plans to do that as well. Uh, what I meant by compliance was, how do you know the scientists will actually give you the data? What is their obligation to actually submit the data oh, okay. yep. to your database? That's right. Their obligation to do it is because if, well, the minister says they have to, the chief scientist says they have to, and the DAD director says they have to. Um, if they don't, then we can pass the information back up the chain to all to the committees that sort of that hand out all the money and say, look, scientist A isn't playing ball; they're not handing in their data. So the next time that scientist comes back to apply for to apply for another project for more funding, they can say, sorry. Is is there a period of time where they can have access? Uh, Basically, keep the the data private until they. Oh, of course, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah there's, okay. I should have mentioned that the um the data they they they're given a, a variable time frame to hand the data over. It's, it averages out to around two years, but it varies a bit depending on the type of project they're running. Um, so once that two years sort of limit if it is up, then we sort of basically start banging on the door a lot harder and say you should have handed it over by now. What else? All right. In case anybody was wondering, data can be hard to find, so can the wallies. But there they were. <laughs> if you're wondering. Okay. 